Hi, Jay Knights. Welcome to today's episode, which is actually the fourth episode of the What the Austin podcast. I'm joined by Georgia from the G Word. So, hi, Georgia. It's great to have you with me. Hi, Izzy. How are you doing? I'm not too bad, not too bad at all. Um, so it'll be great to find out kind of like how you got into Austin and um, to hear a little bit about your blog and your Instagram account. Got a blog page on Instagram called The G Word. And I got into Austin all, all down to my mum, really. My mum introduced me to my first Austin text, which was Pride and Prejudice. And that was at the age of 12, I will say. I watched the, I will admit, I did watch the film before I read the book. I know, shock horror, even to myself now. Um, But no, it was, um, it's the whole world of Austin and the use of language and how the strong protagonist in Pride and Prejudice, of course, which we will talk about, um, and with Charlotte Lucas as well, that is uh, how I got hooked in on Austin and my life has been changed since. So yeah that's me (laughs) no I love that it's so great I love hearing like what people like what was their original into Austin not only like is it the book was it a film was it any adaptation um so that's really great Mm -hmm. I love that so um today's episode we'll be discussing Charlotte Lucas from Pride and Prejudice and um despite being a secondary character she has a pretty memorable storyline um I'd say anyway Mm -hmm. it starts with Mr and ends with Collins (laughs) yes what what a character let's say out of all the austin books he stands out like a sore thumb doesn't he <laughs> <laughs> absolutely i've kind of split split some ideas up as you know and i thought where we could probably start is her opinions on marriage before she's actually married so um i have a quote here which i think really stands out in this is about charlotte marriage had always been her object and i think that really speaks to charlotte's character because I put two mm. points down that I think she's both calculated and practical because um, she's got such a pragmatic view on marriage. So, um, yeah, is there any kind of like main words that stick out for you and then we can kind of discuss them individually? Yeah, I mean, just instantly looking from that quote, like what you just said, it really, you can a- attribute it to Charlotte so much. I think when you compare her to Elizabeth, I think they're both such strong characters. But I think for Charlotte, it's always been this threat that she that she has to marry and she can't afford to wait I think with what is her situation compared to Elizabeth's marriage is what she needs but I don't think she conforms to how like how other women in the gentry class with a typical marriage of convenience I think she's very grounded compared when you compare her to Jane or if you compare her especially to Lydia Lydia Bennett I think Charlotte realizes the seriousness of her situation compared to other women um that she interacts with right um, yeah so yeah. Mm. yeah I think I mean I think you definitely have a more sympathetic look on Charlotte than I do not that I think she's a bad person a bad character um but um yeah I think like when I say terms like calculated I don't mean that in the harshest sense I mean it in um like for instance the um scene at the ball when she's chatting with Elizabeth and um Jane's with Mr Bingley Mm. and she makes it clear that she thinks it's important that Jane should secure him (laughs) before love like love is a secondary thought for her she's literally just like she needs to secure him as a husband then she can worry about falling in love with him after um and what's so funny about it like you were saying about Elizabeth that Elizabeth even thinks she's joking because her thoughts are like so different to Charlotte's she's like oh you never act that way yourself but the truth is that is Charlotte's true feelings on the matter isn't it no it is and I think I think in that moment when she sees Jane with Mr Bingley it's sense that she has her own worries and she's um I think she's putting them onto other people especially because I mean with Jane is quite a reserved character as from what you see in the novel she doesn't outwardly go up to people or not people to Mr Bingley and saying I love you I love you or really over the top compared to her sister Lydia um, and yeah. I think what it is for Charlotte it's she's so worried about it herself that she's expressing her concerns onto others um yeah, no, that scene, it is classic, though, because um, she has no idea, and then Elizabeth is just joking alongside, and she's like, no, I'm being completely serious. <laughs> See, absolutely. 
in I feel like that only sinks in later in the book around chapter 22 um that you see that there's actually a line that says uh, when she's trying to kind of capture Mr Collins as a husband now that she knows that he's after a wife is um the book actually states such, such was Miss Lucas's scheme like it actually calls it a scheme like that she's actually mm. out to catch her husband this I think scheme I think it all depends on the perspective of how we are now I think if you were to say if you were to transport Pride and Prejudice to, to today's climate if you say um such was Miss Lucas's scheme you'd be like oh she's a bit of a I don't know gold digger or something or oh she's a bit she needs to calm down but I think that she's I think she's just so worried and especially at the time when marriages marriages of convenience were just the norm and you've got Elizabeth who is not afraid she knows the threat she knows that her dad is going to die soon but she's she's not worried and I think I think when you look at Charlotte you do have to uh, well, you don't you don't have to, but I sympathise with her situation because I think such as Miss Lucas's steam, I think it's steam in the sense that she's just so determined to make sure that she's safe. She might be a bit annoying because of that. Don't get me wrong; she probably is a bit annoying to be around because of that. Yeah. I was going to say, like, because I think I take like a really different view on it because it's literally a couple of lines after that. It's the scene where she's looking out the window. She sees Mister Collins walking down the path. And she mm. purposely goes out to accidentally, quote unquote, meet him in the path. And that's actually when he ends up proposing to <laughs> yeah. her. But it's like True. she she like makes these things happen, which I don't necessarily think is a bad thing. Like you said, with the context of the time, um, mm. you you are in need of a husband if you're in her position. So I don't think she's like malicious or and I definitely wouldn't consider her a gold digger. But I think she's definitely... Um, practical and calculated in the way that she goes about this that Mm. she is not getting caught up on love like I think that she actually says um I'm not a romantic you know like she's she's very clear she's like love is not my priority my priority is security if I fall in love then that's just an added bonus but it's not what I'm looking for (laughs) yeah and that's that was with most marriages at the time wasn't it really it was just that sense of security I mean that is is when you put them two quotes together from what you just said, how she accidentally bumps into him, then then it's like, oh, look, they're engaged. I mean, she is kind of in the background steaming, isn't she, um, her situation? But I think, I think um, she, I think she's just, just so worried. Right. I think, I think it's just her sense of, it's this sense urgency. of urgency. Yeah. Mm, completely. That yeah. she's just like, I need to find someone. Oh, look, Elizabeth has rejected Collins, even though he's a complete moron. Let's go for that one. <laughs> it's, <Yeah>. just, <laughs> it's just like, okay, that one's not working. Aha, there's a free bird. I'll go after that one kind of thing. So yeah, bless her. Right, absolutely. <laughs> the opportunity arises and she takes it. And mm. um, Elizabeth doesn't take that opportunity. Obviously, um, she strives for love. That's what she always says is her main priority. But we can't like push Charlotte aside for the fact that she's seen the opportunities there. She knows what she wants and she's going to go and go, go and get it. Do you know what I mean? She's probably quite a strong character yeah. in that sense. She doesn't, um, like, I mean, to, to go and get engaged to someone who's literally just proposed to your best friend in itself is quite ballsy. <laughs> I'd say a bit ballsy. Yeah. Just not even to be like, oh, are you okay? She's just like, see ya, that one's free. Mr. Collins. <laughs> yes, literally. But um no, I, ha- no handing around for Charlotte. <laughs> no, absolutely not. But I think he makes such a good point that it's so easy to compare Charlotte and Elizabeth. And I think it is set up in the novel to do that, um, to see their differences. I mm. think more to big Elizabeth up, but I think if you take it, look at it the other way. Elizabeth's in a very different situation to Charlotte in the sense that Elizabeth is 20. So, you know, I mean, the age difference makes a significant point because um, with context of the time, as you well know, um, the term spinster Mm. and old maid, like I actually, those terms themselves were actually coined in the 18th century, which just shows you how powerful they must have been at the time. Like if a term comes out nowadays, it's like- Yeah, definitely. You know what I mean? It, if it's used, it's so much more powerful, which that mm. was the term of the time. So, 
Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, um, I've got I've got a quote here. It says, I'll read it first. It says, so in Charlotte society, if a woman was seen to be unmarried by a certain age, she was not worthy of getting a husband in all her life. And that is from Salma Haig, if I'm saying that right, which is Charlotte Lucas's practical approach to marriage. And I think from what you just said, it's the age difference. So Lizzie, like you said, is 20 and Charlotte's 27, isn't she? So yeah. she, it's that sense of, she probably has about a year, two years maybe. Um, and then she has to, and then she's going to be doomed. So it is that real, real sense of urgency when you compare her to Elizabeth, who is so relaxed and so going with it and turn and so... Um, headstrong that she's turning away suitors in the sense that she's just not interested um, right. so yeah definitely Charlotte like you said has that urgency that Elizabeth doesn't have and I think although we can be like oh yeah Elizabeth definitely turned down Mr Collins because none of us like him it's like yeah Elizabeth's our heroine she's younger Charlotte is older and probably represents like the, the realities of the time there was probably more Charlotte's yeah. than there was Elizabeth's and I think Austin kind of shows that. I mean, it is definitely, um, I think Austin shows that there is the possibility to have an have a relationship like Elizabeth has with Darcy. But I think she also shows that this is still the reality that women like Charlotte had to accept their circumstance and make the best situation possible out of it. And it's sad to see really because of how admirable Charlotte is for me personally. I think she could have anyone she wants, but I think what makes her so admirable and it's what Elizabeth comes to understand is that she, she uh, Charlotte shapes marriage to suit her. I don't think she bends to the patriarchal standards of the time of how um, a woman should be this and she should, shouldn't have an independent mind. I think Charlotte still retains that in her marriage which I think doesn't mean that marriage constrains her. I think she's still quite liberated in it uh, mentally. That's really interesting. No, I totally, I totally get where you're coming from. And also her, the alternative is pretty dire. Like you only have to look at characters like Miss Bates mm. from Emma, um, which I think Emma yeah. actually makes a really good point that there's a huge difference between remaining single and being a rich heiress than being a poor woman yeah. who's single mm. and you know what I mean and even Charlotte says like she was a burden to her family like that alone is such a horrible feeling and should is her father word? die it's like that should her father die mm. you, you know what I mean well we see that in Sense Sensibility with the Dashwoods like their father dies they end up mm. in a cottage like they have to downsize dramatically it's <laughs> yeah it's that it's the emphasis behind that word burden today it's not it's not really uh, seen. I mean, for me personally, I'm hoping I'm not a burden to my parents. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? We'll find out. Um, but it's that sense of, it's that word burden, I think is so important for Charlotte's context because she really has no other choice. She does, otherwise she's going to end up as, as a spinster and she's going to be, pushed out onto the fringes of society and I think it's it's truly awful awful that that is how women were treated that past a certain age you were right. seen as pleasing to the male eye you were you were seen as old and she's only 27 I know like, it's crazy I literally saw this mm. quote and it said that um at the time women were no longer considered victims after they reached a certain age that they were actually to blame for not being able to catch mm. a husband like it was like it was your fault you weren't able to attract somebody and I yeah. think even the society in Pride and Prejudice like they they already start to consider Charlotte a spinster like even Mrs mm. Bennett says at one time like oh she's basically just a spinster now so it's yeah. do you know what I mean she's already she's got these people around her already saying that so that's an added pressure. Then on top of that, she feels a burden to her parents. I mean, you can kind of understand why when someone came along, she was like, I need to take this. Yeah, even if he is a complete pain in the ass. <laughs> yeah, right. Numpty or not, let's go for it. <laughs> but then you contrast uh, you contrast Charlotte's situation to um, Lydia Bennett, who uh, I think, if I've got this right, uh, girls could, I think from the age of 12, 
they could marry, but they still needed a license to marry, um, if I've got that correct. And um, I think you've got Lydia, who's completely away with the fairies, let's be honest. She's not there for her age. She's 15 years old. And next thing you know, she marries Mr Wickham. She's not aware of her situation. She has no idea what his true character is like. And it's only really revealed uh, to Elizabeth once she's told the truth from Mr. Darcy. And it's too late by and it's too late by then. But you've got Lydia and you've got Charlotte. You've got Charlotte who understands her situation. She has to marry. And then you've got Lydia who's like, oh my gosh, I'm so taken away. The Scarlet Coat, a military man, he'll protect me. The stereotypes that come attached, and she's just not there. Her blindness just fools her completely. Right, absolutely. So, like on a scale, Lydia's like one end, and Charlotte's the other. Elizabeth probably mm, falls somewhere in the middle. But yeah, um, even even then, like the Bennett situation is pretty bleak. It's probably worse than Charlotte's families, to be perfectly honest with you. In mm-hmm. um, but yeah, it's it's strange how pragmatic Charlotte is compared to like the Bennett sisters. Like you have people like Lydia mm. and the family who are completely oblivious to the situation. Elizabeth's aware of it but then is quick to judge Charlotte for her choice and think she's a fool yeah like do you know what I mean it, it's quite strange yeah. when the realities I think that's age I genuinely think that's the difference in age I don't think she's at the point where it's urgent enough for her to fully comprehend her situation no definitely and I think for Elizabeth I think when she hears that Charlotte isn't engaged to be married to Mr Collins I think she believes that um it's it's kind of I think personally rude how she kind of pushes her aside and she's like how how can you do this to yourself but then you've got to think well Elizabeth don't you know the situation that you're in you've got your father who's going to die soon and you you have this looming threat over you and you seem like you don't you have no idea and Charlotte I think she makes marriage work for herself because she makes it she's still independent and I think Elizabeth believes that she's sacrificing that when she's not I think she sees it such as a marriage you've I've got to retain my independent mind I've got to be free my mind but also free my body I can do whatever I want I can still go wherever I want and I think as soon as she hears that Charlotte's engaged she's like I thought you believed in the same principles and she does but yet again it's that whole misunderstanding of the situation that she's in um definitely so yeah no I absolutely get that and and Elizabeth is extremely harsh um at one point I think um that she's just kind of recalling her thoughts and she says like it's the most humiliating picture Mm. like I mean that's brutal um Mm. like I wrote a lot about this in the past that and the narrative is so close to Elizabeth's thoughts that the narrative itself almost rejects Charlotte like it seems to brush her aside like Charlotte yeah. took a pragmatic approach. This is a romantic novel. So Charlotte's kind of pushed pushed to one side after that. It's like, okay, we've got rid of the reality side of things. Now let's look yeah. at the fantasy side. So obviously people marrying above their station wasn't, was like did happen. It's not like unbelievable. Mm. But the point is, like I said before, there, is, there would have been more Charlottes than there was Elizabeth's. No, definitely. Elizabeth's pretty harsh. Um, Mr. Bennett's really harsh as well. He calls her a fool at one point. He was like... <laughs> When I first read Pride and Prejudice and I saw that, I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, stand down. I think that's a step too far. To call her a fool, even though she's looked at her situation rationally, she's marrying someone, she's actually understanding what she's doing compared to your daughter later on with Lydia. Like, I don't think he has any right to call her that, really. Right, absolutely not. And I think with time, Mr. Bennett does reflect on his like thoughts about these things, but and so does Elizabeth, because at the end, mm. um, although she doesn't necessarily um still fully accept it, I think she because she learns to understand her situation and she actually says, like, um, all in all, it's probably a good match. Um yeah. so I, I appreciate that that obviously um, I mean, they're never they're never as close again, which is interesting. I think that mm. Elizabeth was too convinced that Charlotte's um, views on things were um, like hers. And yeah. I think the fact that they differed in what they're willing to marry for um, mm. kind of put a bit of a damper on their relationship. 
And then yeah. um, I think how easily Charlotte fit into her life, the fact that she has her own house now. Um, she's got a pretty good standing in society because Mr. Collins, like, in terms of, of societal standing, isn't a ba- in a bad position. You know what I mean? Being a mm. rector's yeah, yeah. wife is, is actually okay. And he's um, obviously got close connections with Lady Catherine. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it's not in the grand scheme. Obviously, Mr. Collins is a bad match, but Mr. Collins in terms of him in a broad sense, isn't a bad match. A bad match, yeah. He, he might be weird with his potatoes, but you know what? You just got to <laughs> accept it. At least you know he'll always compliment your potatoes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he'll always be a harsh critic, Charlotte, so you got to make sure you get your potatoes right, otherwise you're in deep water. <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> so I think we should probably, like, open more up about this, um, the independence, mm. like you were saying. Um and I think she does have a lot of independence for the sense that she makes him stay in the garden so often. <laughs> yes. yes, I mean, it's the quote from the book when it's, uh, so Elizabeth goes to see Charlotte after she's uh, married Mr. Collins and Elizabeth states, uh, when Mr. Collins could be forgotten, there was, a re- there was really a great air of comfort throughout and by Charlotte's evident enjoyment of it, Elizabeth supposed he must be often forgotten. <laughs> so... <laughs> She's shaped it. She's just been like, yeah, and this is my space. You, you'll stay outside. And she, she shapes it to see what she needs. And I think Austin shows that. I think marriage doesn't have to be a woman goes into the home and she has to be this and doing that and sewing this and making this and making the house look nice. I think she shows that a woman, when she's in the home, she shapes it to suit what she needs. And Charlotte is like, what I need is for him to be away from where I am (laughs) right (laughs) for him to be away and for me to run my own home like I think that's yeah it is there's such a like a strength there which I really appreciate Mm. in her um because like I said I mean I'm I'm not always that sympathetic to Charlotte um and I don't know whether that's just maybe I'm too much of a romantic to fully comprehend Charlotte's situation and appreciate her as a character Mm. but um I do think she makes it her own and she just she's like maybe mm. this isn't the best situation but I'm gonna make it a good situation for me which I I think that's worth yeah. appreciating definitely but I think I can completely agree with you because I didn't really understand Charlotte's situation until I've spent a good part of my dissertation analyzing Charlotte's situation because before you read it and you really only focus on Elizabeth Mr Darcy and Jane and Mr Bingley and anything else that happens in between is like, oh, wow. And then, okay, back to Elizabeth now or back to this. But it wasn't until you understand the context of Charlotte's situation and you actually analyse uh, who she is, like the marriage of convenience that we were talking about and the, like, the threat behind being a spinster and being that burden, that you actually see, okay, she's actually such an important character because... And then she's trying to push this aside, but she's important because she shows that marriage, marriage had to had to be a woman's path, but it didn't have to be the end of it. It didn't have to be marriage and then you settle. It was marriage and then you shape it to shape it to your life and you keep living it, I guess. And also, we've got to bear in mind, Charlotte's situation as it is when the novel ends is very different than what it's going to be in the future because Mr. Collins mm. is um, going to inherit Longbourn, which yes. is like another like massive thing. And I think Mrs. Bennett makes a, um, a bit of a snide comment about it. She's like, the Lucases, they're all out for what they can get. Like, she thinks that Charlotte's a gold digger. It's like she goes from yeah. one thing, it's like Charlotte's going to be a spinster. And then when Charlotte actually goes and finds a husband next thing you know she's a gold digger it's gold like digger. make up your mind miss bennett <laughs> exactly i mean i like mrs bennett can talk she's completely away with the fairies let's be honest she's <laughs> yeah. there calling people gold diggers and whatever and actually you're like mm, look at your youngest child but anyway moving on <laughs> yeah <laughs> absolutely she's so quick to judge it's hilarious mm. Um, I think yeah. another interesting point to make is that austin herself was in a very similar position but actually didn't she took more of Elizabeth's approach because um, she was proposed to by Harris Bigler and yeah. she accepted only to refuse him the next morning. I could totally relate to that so much. Let- I'd sleep on it and I'd be like, oh Lord, no, what am I doing? <laughs> I'm such a warrior. I'd be like, yes. And then I'd be like, wait, no, 
actually yes. oh god I don't know it's like I'll be like mom is this a good thing I should do I'm not too sure yes. mom <laughs> I know I'm such an overthinker like that I'd like wake up the next day and I'd be like oh and so like a hot sweat like is it that or I'd be like um yeah I mean only if you want to I mean I don't want to pressure you or anything only if you're up to it <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave it in only your car you like it yeah <laughs> oh please don't make me make the decision I've got no idea <laughs> that's so funny um so oh my, my dissertation is really different in the sense that um your dissertation I, is amazing oh, thank <laughs> you. and I think and like I was saying before how the narrative kind of pushes her aside Charlotte is pivotal for Elizabeth to get what she wants it's that Charlotte mm. is shows the yeah. alternative to marrying for love like she shows an alternative which is marrying for money maybe it mm. wasn't callous like that maybe it wasn't she's not like a gold digger but she does marry for self-preservation and um yes yeah. in doing that you know what I mean it, it shows a marked contrast to Elizabeth marrying for love love's got to succeed so money needs to be pushed aside the person that chooses money needs to be pushed out of the narrative for the love to kind of be the main outcome and then that's Bingley Jane Elizabeth Darcy so mm, mm. I think she's pivotal for, to push the marriage plot forward. And yeah, um, definitely. I, and that's why I think she's such a, she's such an important character. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you want to add anything. To that. Um, well, let's face it. If Elizabeth didn't go to see Charlotte, then she wouldn't have bumped into Mr. Darcy again, if I got that correct. If my memory serves yes. me right. So if she hadn't, actually made a decision to go see her because like we said earlier there's actually that moment of time when they don't speak to each other and there's and you don't actually hear from Charlotte for a while if Elizabeth didn't make that decision to go see her then that relationship with Mr Darcy then Elizabeth's future could have been unknown it could have been a completely different path but no I, I completely understand about I completely agree even on what you said about money and how I think Austin shows uh, what I say in my dissertation uh, is that it's like Austin shows how marriage was seen more of an uh, economic side. It was all to do with the money and love was kind of pushed to the back burner. And I think that is shown with Charlotte's relationship. But I also think Austin shows that, yes, money still plays a role in it, but it shouldn't be the pivotal, uh, it shouldn't be at the forefront of that union I right, think 100%. love is still important, definitely. Yeah. So no, I, I agree. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's so true. Do you want to chat about some of like the adaptations and how they like portray Charlotte? I think they do the book justice. Like her character really comes definitely. through in the adaptations, I think. I will have to admit, I have only watched the... I am meaning to watch the BBC version of Pride and Prejudice. <gasps> with, um, You've I not watched the Colin I'm... Firth one? I'm so sorry. I've watched that moment in the lake. Don't my mum was like, you need to watch it when I like first ever saw <laughs> it. So I have, I know, shock horror. I am so sorry, Jay Knights. I'm so sorry. But I that is something I'm meaning to watch. I have only watched the Kieran Knightley version of Pride and Prejudice because I'm gonna call out my dad here. He's obsessed with Kieran Knightley. So we watched that. <laughs> Just for Kieran Knightley, really. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's hilarious. It's one I... of my dad's favourite films, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually, that's the funniest thing ever. That's brilliant. Oh my god. <laughs> so that's, yeah, that's how I watched it. I think the adaptation of Charlotte from what I've seen, uh, only from that version, I think it's very truthful to how she's seen in the book. Um, especially, especially that moment um, when she accepts Mr Collins' proposal and it's when she it's something along the lines of she says to Elizabeth, "Don't you dare judge me, Lizzie." Yes, uh, a, she when, repeats when, that. Yeah, when Elizabeth's on the swing mm. and she goes over to her. Yeah, mm. I think Elizabeth is quite judgmental um, mm. as a character, anyway, and she's quick to judge people. Um, so yeah. I think, I think, like I said before, it was, it was probably a shock to Elizabeth that Charlotte did that because she was so convinced that they were on the same page. But definitely, um, I think Charlotte really stands her ground there. She's like, you know, don't judge me for this decision because we're, although in time we'll be in the same situation at the moment, I'm mm. far more advanced than, than you are. And I need to yeah. be realistic and um, choose what's best for me. Yeah, definitely. I think that moment shows that 
Elizabeth, up until that time, she's been judging Mr. Darcy. She's, she's judging everything around her. She's judging her mother quite a lot of the time. And I think it shows that Charlotte has the guts. Like, yes, they are thick as thieves most of the time, her and Elizabeth. But that moment when she's like, don't you dare judge me. You have no right to judge me. Because she doesn't. Because she doesn't know her situation. Yes, they are in similar situations, but she's not in Charlotte's shoes. And I think that moment really shows Charlotte to you really get on uh, you side with Charlotte personally for me there because Elizabeth is there just throwing around critiques and she doesn't understand. And I think she needs to be put back on the right path. And I think Charlotte does that to her instead of right. getting high up into the clouds. So yeah, definitely. Right. And I think um, Charlotte starts the catalyst for Elizabeth to have to reconsider how, who she's judged up mm. until this point because like it's, it's from that point she has to reconsider judging Charlotte then she gets the letter from Darcy realizes that she completely misjudged him mm. and Wickham's actually the the villain of the story yes. <laughs> do you know what I mean this it starts a catalyst where she's actually like um maybe I've completely misjudged people yeah yeah and exactly it's I think it's um it's the moment in the film when she has the letter and then I think Charlotte then walks in Oh, right and, yeah and she's just like is everything okay <laughs> oh my gosh yes like, Mr Darcy's just left but I just love how she walks in and Elizabeth's there reading the letter and she's like oh god like I've really messed up here like oh my, like all of this truth is spilling out over this letter and that letter is so significant to Elizabeth and Darcy's time and then and then Charlotte just walks in and she's like is everything all right <laughs> she's like do we need a cup of tea like I feel like symbolically that also just shows um, how Charlotte does push the storyline forward. Like she's always just kind of there and she helps things move to the path that they need to be on. Like you said, it's like Mr. Darcy's first proposal is when she's staying with um, Charlotte and Mr. Collins. So do you know yeah. what I mean? Like loads of really important moments happen uh, when she's visiting them. It's been taken out of the home. I think she's so comfortable in the environment she's in and then she's taken and she stays with Charlotte and it's a new environment and even though she's with Charlotte so she has like that uh, family tether but it's, it's suddenly where all this truth is revealed and I think it's I think Austin shows the importance of Lizzie not being at home when this truth is revealed <gasps> right I think it could have easily been done at uh at Longbourn but I think uh you would have had as you see later when Lady Catherine comes around, it's the whole family, everyone's like mashing together and it all gets really chaotic. But I think right. it kind of shows Lizzie's vulnerability by taking her out of this setting and then all this truth to hit her. She then goes back home with a new perspective. And I think that's yes. crucial to her journey. Mm. Oh my gosh. And then just thinking about that, I just had another thought actually is the novel starts with Charlotte, even though Charlotte's at home, she's in a state of like confusion, doesn't feel secure, it's all like that. And then it flips and Elizabeth is like that. Once Charlotte's secure in her home, runs her own house and she's very confident at that point, Elizabeth mm -hmm. uh, is like put into a state of turmoil and confusion and she's like having to reevaluate everything. So that's so interesting how their roles kind of flip um, mm. because Charlotte, um, Elizabeth's very much like, in her zone when they're at yeah. um, Longbourn and you know they're going to balls around there when they go to Neverfield etc and um I think you definitely see her vulnerability like when she's um staying with Mr Collins and um Charlotte like when she goes to like Lady Catherine's and stuff like she's it's, it's, it's probably the most awkward times for Elizabeth oh, like when they make up yeah. the piano and all of that but Charlotte is just like steadfast just you know what I mean doing her own mm. thing in a respective member of that society if anything, it's a complete switch yeah. from, from how it was previously because Charlotte was the one who's always nervous and she has that worry and everything said previously. And then there in front of Lady Catherine, she's just there and she's content and she's um, obviously she's a bit worried for Elizabeth. She's like, oh gosh, she's going to have to go play the piano. But she's also like, I don't have that pressure anymore because I've got that comfort. Right. And then Lizzie's just there like, I can't play the piano. <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> no it's so true I'd hate no. to be in that situation oh gosh I honestly reading that moment in the book I don't think I was like this I was like I oh my gosh yeah I was like 
that, oh, that is the beauty God. of being married though once you're married you don't need to worry about that kind of thing nobody's going to press you to do anything you're mm. you're your own mistress at that point in yeah definitely <laughs> I just and then like and then she's bless her Lizzie's trying so hard to play the bloody piano and then like Mr Darcy comes over and everyone creeping and, over yeah and I just went I'm, I'm sorry can you just leave me alone because I'm really trying to play here and it's just like <laughs> Lizzie Caffin's just right there like can you help me out here and just leave me alone just for once <laughs> I know it's so funny oh my gosh I'd actually want to die and Lady Catherine going on about how how important music is to her and how she'd be like a proficient if she'd like learn and I'd be like oh my god I'm dying inside as I'm just like stumbling around trying to play yeah. the worst thing ever and you're like you want me to play now after you've just said all of that <laughs> yeah, no pressure <laughs> okay shall we wrap up with some final thoughts then um, yeah so let's do it. I'd say um that Charlotte's in, um, situation is understood but not accepted by the novel but mm. I think um in the realities of Regency England um it would have been a much more common scenario and even encouraged so I feel yeah. like um people probably could have related more to Charlotte she was the norm Elizabeth was the fantasy I'd say um yeah and I think even Elizabeth, like I said before, comes to understand Char- Charlotte's choice. Um, mm-hmm. And I feel like Charlotte is such a strong character. It's actually been so interesting to talk this through with you because talking it through has made me appreciate more of her strength. And she really does make it her own, doesn't she? And I love that, actually. She, she does. I think it could have been very easy for Austin to portray Charlotte's situation as a marriage of convenience and then she disappears. I think it could have been... But she shows that, I think, uh, I think she shows with both Charlotte and, and obviously with Elizabeth, that it was possible to make marriage, to make your own in the sense that it didn't have to be what society dictated once you were married. Obviously, you still had to conform to, uh, especially with what Charlotte being married to Mr. Collins, she still had to, like, when they go out in public, be that person for him. But I think it still shows that um, you make a marriage to suit yourself and I also think it shows that marriage doesn't um, doesn't need you to sacrifice your independence yes you might be constrained physically within the home setting but Charlotte's independent mind doesn't grow you still have that um, uh, freedom of mind and I think that is then reinforced with Elizabeth when she sees Charlotte I think Elizabeth up until then is thinks that if you if you marry, you lose that uh, self, in, like that independence. And she sees Charlotte, and she understands that marriage doesn't have to be such a constricting position. Um, right. And that changes for the better, I think. Yeah, absolutely. No, I love that. Yeah, I totally agree as well. So, um, mm. no, it's been great to like talk this out, though. This is why I love doing these episodes because it's so fun to just like talk about a specific character or a topic or part of the book, etc. And it's just really interesting no, exactly. to kind of yeah delve into it it's great um yeah so... no, I've had such a fun time so thank you for having me <laughs> <laughs> so glad so um where can people find you then just so that they know yeah so I'm I am mostly on Instagram um at the g word is uh my page I'm also on Facebook with the same username and I also um have a website with my blog on which is on my Instagram page there's a link tree link which is probably the easiest way to find it instead of giving the whole link address over a podcast recording no yes. absolutely <laughs> <laughs> no my Instagram is probably the best place to go for all fun content and my life <laughs> I'll add kind of all your links um on my website underneath where this podcast will be um so that people can you know just use those links as well and click and find you easily so that's really great Um, but yeah we'll wrap it up there yeah thank you so much for having me